Have you ever tried to read the entire Bible and gotten stuck halfway through or been too intimidated to even start? We have the perfect book for you. It's from the St. Philip Institute and it's called From the Beginning, God's Search for Man. In 47 days, we guide you through the big picture of Scripture from Genesis to the Resurrection. Each day, there is a short reading from the Bible accompanied by an essay to help you see the connections between the Old and New Testament. You can pre-order today for $5 at stphilipinstitute.org. Thanks. In this episode of the St. Philip Institute podcast, we're going to begin a new series looking at the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the Eucharist. Um, So we'll be walking through all of the paragraphs in the Catechism of the Catholic Church over the next several weeks, uh, breaking it down into smaller bite-sized pieces, reading the Catechism to you, and then also offering some basic explanations and commentaries on what it is we find in this great document that the Church gives us to help us understand our faith. Please enjoy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, you called St. Philip the Evangelist to open his mouth and begin with Scripture, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we too are called to work for the salvation of souls. Instill in our hearts the zeal of St. Philip, that we may convert hearts and minds to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, my name is Luke Arredondo, and I'm the Director of Faith Formation, and I want to welcome you to this episode of the St. Philip Institute podcast. We are going to be discussing today um, the beginning part of the Catechism of the Catholic Church as it treats the Eucharist. So here in the Diocese of Tyler, we are uh, celebrating a year of Mary and the Eucharist, and we thought it would be a really good opportunity for us to really just take the, the teaching from the Catechism on the Eucharist and break it open um, for the people of the Diocese of Tyler and, and of course, beyond. So what we'll be doing in in each of the uh, next few episodes is reading short sections from the Catechism and then just offering some commentary and explanation um, to guide us through it. It's really not that long altogether. Um, There's about 100 paragraphs from the Catechism that treat the Eucharist, and so we'll just take off bite-sized pieces and and work our way through it until we get to the end. So just really quickly, um, something important important. I I, I don't know that the Catechism of the Catholic Church is very important, but I think there's also a lot of Catholics who might be a little overwhelmed by it. You know, it's kind of a large book, and it's sort sort of a bizarre document if you're not familiar with it. It's broken into four parts. The first part is the profession of faith, the creed. The second part is about, it's called the celebration of the, of the Christian mystery. It's about sacraments. The third part is about uh, life in Christ, which is sort of morality, commandments, the Beatitudes. And the fourth part is about prayer. So I really encourage you, if you are Catholic or interested in being Catholic, to, to take a look at the Catechism, um, not just the section on the Eucharist, but that's what we're going to be working with here today. So the the teaching on the Eucharist begins in paragraph 1322 um, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and that's where we are going to start. So I'll read briefly and then offer some commentary and just kind of work our way through it um, for our first lesson on the Eucharist from the Catechism. Paragraph 1322 begins, The Holy Eucharist completes Christian initiation. Those who have been raised to the dignity of the royal priesthood by baptism— and configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation, participate with the whole community in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. So that first paragraph actually situates for us where the Church understands Eucharist to fit into the Christian life. And you might not see that on your own or or hear it, you know, quite so naturally just in reading that, that paragraph, but you'll notice Baptism is listed first. So first, you've been baptized and raised to the dignity of the, of the royal priesthood through baptism, then configured more deeply to Christ by confirmation. Now you are called to participate in the Lord's own sacrifice by means of the Eucharist. For a lot of Catholics, almost everywhere, um, in the United States at least, there's 13 dioceses where this is an exception, Eucharist is actually received prior to confirmation. Um, Here in the Diocese of Tyler, we're a restored order diocese, and there are 12 others in in the U.S. where we restore 
baptism, the order of baptism, then confirmation, and then Eucharist. And that's not to say it's bad if you receive communion before confirmation. That's certainly the Church allows that. But in, in the theology, the Church sees that the Eucharist actually is the most significant of those sacraments. It's the final sacrament of initiation um, as, it's, as it's laid out here in this paragraph. So that's the first thing to say is that the Church sees the Eucharist as, as the most significant, you know, um, the culmination, rather, of, of, of the initiation. 1323, the next paragraph, says, At the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again, and so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the Church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given. There's a really condensed paragraph that has a lot of information in it. And actually, that entire paragraph is taken from the Second Vatican Council, uh, the document Sacrosanctum Concilium, the document, the Sacred Constitution on the Liturgy. Um, one of the great things about the Catechism is that it shows you where its sources are, are cited from, and what you see is Scripture and the Second Vatican Council are the two most frequently cited texts. And in this paragraph, you see so many different ways of describing the Eucharist, uh, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet. All of those are ideas that, that can be spelled out more, and some of them specifically are later in the Catechism. So later in our, in our sections, sessions, we'll get to what the Church says about the Eucharist as a pledge of future glory. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's actually at the very end of this this session, uh, this section on, on the Eucharist in the Catechism, so we will get to it, so, so stay tuned for that episode. But it's a sacrament of love, it's a sign of unity. I want to draw attention, though, to the, the idea of the Eucharist as a Paschal banquet. So the word Paschal, right, refers to um, the, the Paschal mystery of Christ, his, his, his suffering, uh, crucifixion, death, and resurrection, um, but it also has roots in Pesach, uh, it's a Hebrew word meaning Passover, right? So there's a, there's a real deep sense in which the Church's teaching on the Eucharist is kind of linked um, to the Old Testament sacrifice of the Passover, um, and that's something that just really keep your eye on throughout this whole um, treatment of the, the Catechism's uh, teaching on the Eucharist is the way in which the Passover is kind of brought in to the discussion, because that really sets a template um, for understanding that. And there's there's a, a really excellent book on that I would recommend by Brant Petrie. It's called Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, and he really brings out some of these Paschal or Passover themes. Okay, so the next paragraph is 1324. I'm going to read actually a couple of paragraphs here and then, and then give you some comments on it. So starting in 1324, the Church says, The Eucharist is the source and summit of the Christian life, the other sacraments, and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the apostolate, are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch. The Eucharist is the efficacious sign and sublime cause of that communion in the divine life, and that unity of the people of God by which the Church is kept in being. It is the culmination both of God's, saving, of God's action sanctifying the world in Christ and of the worship men offer to Christ and through him to the Father in the Holy Spirit. This first line here in 1324, the source and summit of the Christian life is a paradox, right? It's the, this means the Eucharist is where everything comes from, like if we don't have the Eucharist, we don't have what we need to live the Christian life, but it's at the same time, it's the summit. It's the high point, and it's the low point. It's where you start, and it's where you end. Um, it's sort of like when, when parents say that they, you know, they walked uphill to school both directions or something like that. Like it doesn't, it doesn't make sense in a, in a geographical sort of way, but in, in a mystical and theological sort of way, the Eucharist lays the foundation for us, and helps us to reach the summit, and is in fact the summit of Christian life. And everything else about the Church is 
oriented toward the Eucharist. And that's a really actually a good sort of uh, way to discern for you if, if you're, you know, involved in some sort of Catholic work, some sort of Catholic apostolate, um, and, and, you know, you're not sure if you can trust it, what's its relationship to the Eucharist? If it's not oriented toward the Eucharist, then that might be something to, to, to really discern. Um, the, the next paragraph, 1325, the Eucharist as an efficacious sign— that is very basic sacramental theology, sacramental theological language, and what that means is there are signs that point toward something, but the sacraments are not merely signs that point us toward something. They are efficacious signs. It means they make present what they point to or what they signify, right? So if you're driving on the highway and you see you know, a sign that says New Orleans 200 miles, uh, that means that in that direction is New Orleans, you know, 200 miles. You're not there yet when you see the sign, uh, it, but it, it is pointing you toward something. The Eucharist and other sacraments are not symbols or signs only. They are efficacious. It means they make present what they signify. So baptism, for instance, the water cleanses, and it has a natural sort of image of cleansing, cleaning, purifying— but it's not just an image of it. It's not just a symbol of it. It actually makes it happen. And the Eucharist is then the efficacious sign that actually brings about communion in the divine life. It also brings about the unity of the people of God. This notion of the Eucharist as a sign of unity is actually one of the things that's really important for us to understand, especially when we talk about ecumenical uh, movements, right? The Church wants to welcome other people, wants to be um, in dialogue with people of other faiths, especially other Christian sects who are close to us in certain ways, have certain, you know, fundamental beliefs in common. But the Eucharist as a sign of that unity, this is why the Church teaches, for instance, that if you are attending um, a church service at, say, a Presbyterian church somewhere um, or a Methodist church somewhere, and they have a celebration of the Lord's Supper or whatever they might call it, um, Catholics are not supposed to receive that because the Eucharist is supposed to be that sign of the fundamental unity that we have among, among ourselves as the body of Christ, and yet in the celebration of the Lord's Supper at a Methodist church or something like that, there's a very different belief of what's what's taking place there. The, the Eucharist is the efficacious sign of the unity of the people of God. And I love this. It's the culmination of God's action sanctifying the world and of the worship that men offer. See, Christ's action in the world sort of reaches its peak both in the Eucharist and at the cross, right? And those two are linked together very closely. But the Eucharist also is the culmination of the worship that we offer um, to the Father in the Holy Spirit. See that Trinitarian, the, the worship we offer to Christ through the Father in the Holy Spirit. All right, move on here to the next couple of paragraphs, 1326 and 27. Finally, by the Eucharistic celebration, we already unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy and anticipate eternal life when God will be all in all. In brief, the Eucharist is the summary, the sum and summary of our faith. Our way of thinking is attuned to the Eucharist, and the Eucharist in turn confirms our way of thinking. The Eucharist unites the heavenly liturgy with our, we unite ourselves with the heavenly liturgy through the Eucharist. That's a really, really big deal. Um, if you've never read Scott Hahn's book, The Lamb's Supper, it shows us some, some of how the imagery in the book of Revelation kind of shows a, a heavenly liturgy that, that, that is a, a heavenly Eucharistic celebration in, in a way. Um, and this is what the Catechism is talking about here. In the Eucharist, we're already participating in the life of heaven. Right? And this is something that, you know, we should know. This is one of the reasons why, you know, you should be quiet in, in church and be respectful, um, why we, you know, use uh, holy water to, to bless ourselves as we go in, why the, why the church is, you know, hopefully is constructed in a way that sort of makes sense of what's happening at that Eucharistic altar, that it is the unity of heaven and earth that is taking place through, this, through the Eucharist, and um, it anticipates what eternal life will be like. In Eucharistic Prayer 1, we actually have um, a line about this that uh, we pray that, that, that the, the offering on our altar will be taken to heaven by, by, by the angel, right? And that is 
hinting, you know, or many I mean hinting, telling us directly in, in that prayer that that's what we're doing. We are in one place at Mass in the church, but we're also already in heaven, which is really, really significant. And one of the things that um, when I first read about that, I, I said, why is, you know, why did nobody tell me? It is, it's in the catechism, but, you know, not everybody reads the catechism, so I can understand um, why maybe that's a, a new thing. And if it is for you, really reflect on that the next time that you're at Mass and the, the fact that we're in, we're in heaven while we're on earth at the same time. All right, so that is the first section of the treatment of the Eucharist in the Catechism. As I said, there's about 100 paragraphs. Um, some of the, the way the text is divided is broken up differently, um, and this is actually a, a little bit shorter episode than what we've previously done on, on the Institute podcast, but we wanted to take a real good opportunity to look at very closely what the what the Catechism says about the Eucharist and just walk through it with you and offer you some helpful suggestions for, for understanding it. So I hope you've enjoyed this first episode, and please stay with us for more um, as we continue to explore the teaching of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the Eucharist in this year of Mary and the Eucharist. Thank you very much.